Hey everyone, welcome to tutorial 24. In this video, we'll get into some of the more complex and interesting techniques in the wavetable synthesis family. In particular, I want to talk about multiple wavetable synthesis using VOSC and wave shaping using Shaper. So let's begin with multiple wavetable synthesis. In the previous video, we spent a lot of time creating different types of wavetables, but when playing these wavetables using OSC, there was no clear or obvious way for us to smoothly transition from one wavetable to another, so we just ended up switching instantaneously, and this is kind of clumsy and unmusical. This is where multiple wavetable synthesis comes in. In this approach, an oscillator has access to more than one wavetable, and here uh, we're just looking at the simplest case with exactly two wavetables. Let's say wavetable on the left has index 0, and on the right, index 1. We provide a floating point index between 0 and 1, and the oscillator will interpolate between these two tables according to the index. And if we use a line, ugen, or something similar, to sweep from 0 to 1, we get this very cool result where one wavetable morphs into another. This is precisely what VOSC is designed to do, so let's see how it works. First, we need to generate at least two wavetables. So here's the code that I used to generate the two wavetables in the animated example we just saw. So load these wavetables into buffers, and then a quick sound function using VOSC. Like OSC, VOSC has an argument that tells it which buffer to use for wavetable information. As we can see here, buffer B0 has buff num0, and B1 has buff num1. So in this case, we could technically use something like mouse x with a range from 0 to 1, allowing us to sweep the mouse across the screen from left to right, causing wavetable 0 to morph into wavetable 1. This works but we're being really sloppy. So I'm going to take a step back for a moment and discuss a few important points to keep in mind when using VOSC. First, let's convert this sound function into a more robust and flexible synth def. The first point is that all the buffers that VOSC uses have to be the same size. We've taken care of this already by creating two signals, each with size 1024. And we can also confirm our wavetables are the same size by checking the number of frames in each buffer. Not being able to mix and match wavetable sizes isn't a big deal at all, it's just something you have to remember. If you do accidentally mix and match, as I'm doing here, then VOSC will fail silently. With no audio glitches, no error messages, just silence. And situations like this, where SuperCollider gives you no feedback at all, can easily be the hardest and most frustrating to debug. So keep all your wavetables the same size, and you'll be fine. Next, it's not really a great idea to hardwire buff nums 0 and 1 into our synth def, like we've done here. Uh, for example, if later on we create additional wavetables with buff nums 2, 3, 4, etc., this overly specific synth def becomes kind of useless. A better solution, is to provide some arguments corresponding to the lowest buff num, call it buff, and the number of buffers you're going to be using, we'll call this num buffs, and then calculate buff pause using some simple math. This keeps the functionality the same, but it adds some very valuable flexibility uh, for which and how many wavetables we want to use. So now instantiating the synth would look like this, providing the lowest buff num and the number of wavetables. Yet another important point is that VOSC assumes, or essentially requires, that your wavetable buffer indices are consecutive ascending numbers. In our case, we allocated these two buffers back to back, one right after the other, so of course they're going to have consecutive buffer numbers, and this won't be a problem. But if you allocate your buffers in a haphazard way, like if you scatter the process into smaller chunks across a larger project, you might inadvertently end up with non-consecutive wavetable buffers, and VOSC won't be able to properly interpolate between them in that case. So let me just free all the buffers and show you what I mean. First, we allocate and fill a buffer with wavetable 0. And then let's pretend we're being careless and allocate a handful of buffers that just take up space and don't do anything. And then 
allocate another buffer and fill it with wavetable 1. So now if we play our synth and sweep the mouse, VOSC morphs from wavetable 0 to whatever's in buffer with buff num1, and that happens to be one of these empty junk buffers. So we're morphing from wavetable to silence. Very boring. So is there a way to guarantee our wavetables will have consecutive indices? One of the most reliable ways, which the VOSC help file actually recommends, is to use the buffer class method alloc consecutive. Here's an example. First, here's some code that creates four random wavetables using the env class and array.fill to store them in an array called tilde wt. You can pause the video if you want to dissect, and keep in mind this is pretty much copy and paste from one of the examples in the previous video. Then we use buffer.alloc consecutive, providing the number of buffers we want, the server on which to create them, and the number of frames in each one. This returns an array that contains these four buffers. Very convenient. Next, we just need to fill these buffers with our four wavetables. We could do this easily by just iterating over the array, tilde buff.do, passing in each buffer and an iteration counter, and use load collection to fill each buffer with the corresponding wavetable data. For a quick visual aid, let's plot these four wavetables. And for clarity, I'll put each buff num in the title bar of its corresponding plot window. I intentionally didn't free the six buffers from the previous example. So those buff nums are still technically in use. Uh, and so these four buffers have buff nums six, seven, eight, and nine. Let's also poll these buff paused values for additional clarity. Finally, play the synth, making sure to specify the lowest index buff num that we're using and the correct number of buffers. On the left edge, here's buff num six morphing to buff num 7 over to buff num 8 and finally at the right edge of the screen buff num 9 so that's very nice we can now smoothly interpolate across an arbitrary number of wavetables now before we jump over to wave shaping I do want to quickly enhance our synth depth to make it a bit more interesting and a little bit less clinical. First, obviously, it makes a ton of sense to have a frequency argument. And instead of mouse X, let's use LF noise 1 to automate and also randomize the position of the wavetable index. So now our shape randomly morphs from one to another, and I don't have to push the mouse around anymore. And I'm going to use multi-channel expansion to make a sort of chorus effect here. I'm going to make a detune signal and make this an 8-channel array of noise generators, uh, each one ranging from negative to positive 0.2 semitones. So then VOSC becomes an array of 8 unique VOSCs. And because we only have two speakers, we're going to use splay to spread the 8 signals across a stereo field. Like we did in the previous video, leak DC is helpful in case there's any weird DC bias. And an amplitude argument, probably a good idea too, so we'll take this mull value away and plug our amplitude control in down here. You can keep going, of course. This example would certainly be improved by including an amplitude envelope. You can also use other types of signals for moving between wavetables. It doesn't have to be a noise generator. So still lots of room for experimentation, but that's multiple wavetable synthesis in a nutshell. Hopefully that puts things in a perspective and gives you a good starting point. So let's move on and talk about wave shaping. Wave shaping involves an input signal. This can be a sine wave, sawtooth wave, whatever and a transfer function. Now, the transfer function is a little bit different. It doesn't represent amplitude as a function of time. 
Instead, it represents an input-output graph with both axes on a normalized amplitude scale between negative 1 and positive 1. Amplitude values from the input signal are fed into the transfer function, and the values that come out of this transfer function are used to construct our output signal. If this is a totally new concept for you, it might be a bit tricky to wrap your brain around it at first, but let's start by imagining a very simple case in which the input signal is a sine wave, and the transfer function is the line y equals x. x is the input, y is the output. This means every value we put into the transfer function comes out unchanged. It makes sense to call this the identity transfer function. It's a special case that has no effect on the input, like multiplying by 1 or adding 0. It's also an extremely boring example of wave shaping, so consider instead the transfer function along the line y equals x over 2. In this case, everything that goes through the transfer function is reduced by half. This has the effect of uniformly scaling down the amplitude of the input signal. Yet another simple case, consider the transfer function along the line y equals negative x. In this case, every value is essentially multiplied by negative 1, and this has the effect of inverting the input signal. Just to reiterate, these three examples are meant to be instructive, so I've made them boring and not musically interesting on purpose. So pause for a second and consider this transfer function. Near x equals 0, the slope is very steep, but it levels off near x equals plus and minus 1. This means low amplitude values in the input signal tend to get boosted away from 0 more rapidly, and medium to high amplitude values will plateau. In more casual terms, our sine wave gets squished and starts to resemble a square wave. Another interesting example, if we have a transfer function that very loosely resembles the line y equals x, but sort of wiggles around it, uh, then we can expect the shape of our input signal to take on these wiggly characteristics. Let's also not forget that our input signal can be whatever we like. So here's a single cycle of a more complex periodic wave being shaped by that same wiggly transfer function, and this is the waveform that we get in this particular case. So keeping these animated examples in mind, let's go back to this relatively simple example with the squished sine wave and put it into practice using Shaper. Shaper has a very simple design. It only needs the transfer function buffer and an audio signal input. So this is the env that I used to create this particular transfer function. And now we've arrived at a point where there's a very important distinction between Shaper and the other wavetable ugens that we've looked at. For OSC and VOSC, we made a signal whose size was a power of 2, and we used as wavetable to convert from signal to wavetable format, like this. The as wavetable method has the effect of doubling the size of the signal because the wavetable conversion process calculates and interleaves additional values into the table in order to make linear interpolation more efficient on the audio server. When we use something like OSC and VOSC, we think of the wavetable as being an inherently cyclic thing, where the end is conceptually connected to the beginning, because in these cases the wavetable is literally being used as one cycle of a periodic wave. So when we use as wavetable, the last interpolation calculation is made using the last point and the first point. Basically the process wraps back around to the beginning in order to finish the job. However, when we're using a wavetable with shaper, we don't conceptualize the wavetable as being inherently cyclic. Instead, we see it as a singular transfer function with a beginning, a middle, and an end. So it doesn't make sense to do the final interpolation calculation using the last and first value because these two values don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. So in order to do the final calculation correctly, we make the size of the signal a power of 2 plus 1, essentially tagging one extra value onto the end for the very last calculation, and we use the method as wavetable no wrap. And notice the size of the resulting wavetable in this case is still a power of 2, which of course is a requirement for using wavetable ugens. This business involving a power of 2 plus 1 and as wavetable no wrap is something we specifically do when using shaper. But for wavetable oscillators, OSC and VOSC, etc., we use a normal power of 2 and the method as wavetable.
The fact that you need to do this when using Shaper is mentioned in a couple of comments in one of the examples in the Shaper help file. Here we see size must be power of 2 plus 1, and as wavetable, no wrap. And this also appears in the signal source file, which is where the as wavetable, no wrap method is defined. So, with that somewhat long detour out of the way, now we can fill a buffer with this transfer function and feed it into Shaper along with a sine wave input signal. That's our simple example, so I'm going to do a more interesting and complex example. For the transfer function, I'm going to start with the identity transfer function. And I'm going to introduce some irregularities by adding this signal to another signal of the same size. For the thing we're going to add, we'll use signal.signfill, and for the amplitude array, we're going to skip the first three partials by silencing them, and then randomly pick three partials from partials 4 through 9, and also randomize the phases. The second signal is going to look something like this. Signal.signfill always normalizes to full amplitude, but I would like to add a scaled down version of this to the identity transfer function. So I'm going to divide this signal.signfill by 4 before adding it, and then normalize the sum of these two signals. And that is going to look something like this. Convert to wavetable using as wavetable no wrap, and fill the buffer. Plot the buffer just to make sure it looks the way it's supposed to. Here's our one liner from before. I'm actually going to space things out a little bit onto multiple lines so that's a little bit easier to read and play it. So, yeah, that's our sine wave shaped by our wiggly transfer function. Here's one thing that is really cool about wave shaping, especially when we have a nonlinear or otherwise crazy looking transfer function. Imagine that we fade in the amplitude of the input signal over a period of time as it goes through the transfer function. What does the output signal do? Well, initially, you might expect to see a boring, predictable, and corresponding simple amplitude fade in with the output signal, but that's not what happens. Instead, what happens is, as input amplitude increases, the shape and spectrum of the output signal evolve in a very interesting way. This happens because as input amplitude increases, we end up using a larger and larger subsection of the transfer function. And each of these transfer function slices is unique. And eventually, when the input signal is at full amplitude, it traverses the entire transfer function. In practice, we can use a line eugen that goes from 0 to 1 over some period of time and multiply it by the input signal before it gets fed into Shaper. And personally, I think this looks really, really cool. And for something even more interesting, we can use a noise generator instead of a line so that the output signal is constantly morphing from one shape to another. Multi-channel expansion is great here, like it usually is. We can make eight sine waves, all slightly detuned, multiply them by eight unique noise generators, and splay these eight signals across stereo. Just to remind you, the input signal does not have to be a sine wave. For example, here's a sawtooth wave. So on the topic of sawtooth waves, the last thing I want to discuss is sort of a different way to conceptualize wave shaping as a signal operation. So far, we've been envisioning the transfer function as a shape that sort of loosely resembles the line y equals x, maybe incorporating angles and curves in order to take some input signal and sort of mush it around. But let's think about this differently. Let's say we have a transfer function, some wiggly thing or whatever, and let's say our input signal is a plain old ramp function that goes from minus 1 to positive 1 in a straight line over and over again. This is exactly what LF saw does. 
In this case, we just end up reading values from the transfer function from beginning to end. So the transfer function actually becomes our cyclic wave shape on the other side. And in fact, take a step back and realize this is exactly how OSC works. We provide a shape which is assumed to be one cycle of a desired periodic wave, and OSC produces that shape again and again and again. So OSC, in fact, is a lot like Shaper, the main difference being that OSC's input, so to speak, is always a linear sawtooth ramp, but with Shaper, the input can be whatever we like. So with this in mind, consider a variation on this idea, with a triangle wave instead of a sawtooth. So now we have a ramp that goes up and down instead of just up. In this case, we read through the transfer function forward and then backward, and this cyclic shape becomes our output waveform. Another variation on this idea involves taking an input signal with linear segments, like this triangle wave here, and mathematically curving it away from linearity. The input slope corresponds to the speed at which we read through the transfer function. So with this kind of shape, we go forward through the transfer function quickly at first, gradually getting slower, then backwards through the transfer function slowly at first, and then gradually getting faster. Let's take a look at these examples in practice. Here's the code for that wiggly transfer function we just saw. It's a little complicated, but everything you see here is covered in the previous video, so I'll leave this as a study exercise if you want to pause the video and pick through it on your own time. Using LFSaw, we linearly index through the transfer function producing a periodic wave with that exact shape. Doesn't sound great or anything, it's pretty harsh, noticeable aliasing because of this giant discontinuity when we jump from the end to the beginning. But using LF try for a triangle wave index, on the other hand, gives us an up-down ramp, so we get the transfer function forward and backward for each cycle. As a result, we no longer have that discontinuity. The waveform is smooth and the spectrum much more mellow. And for that curving operation we just saw, uh, first let's take a look at a plot of a basic triangle wave. We can use the method lin curve to bend these linear segments. The input range is going to be the same as the output range, so negative positive 1 maps onto negative positive 1, and the fifth value in lin curve is the curvature, and this behaves exactly the same as the numbers in a curve array for env.new. So 0 is linear, which will have no effect, but here's the result with a curve value of negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. So let's plug this into our sound function. And we get a pretty funky looking wave with a noticeably different shape and spectrum. And we can even audition a few other numbers here to really see and hear and just reinforce what's going on. And if you're wondering, yes, we absolutely can use a UGen, like a noise generator or something else, to control the curvature. In case you haven't noticed, I am completely unable to resist the siren song of multi-channel expansion, which is very handy for enriching your synthesis with chorus, detuning, and other nice things. I'm not sure if leak DC is strictly necessary, but as we've seen, it's probably a good and safe thing to do here. If we were going to turn this into a synth def, it might look something like this. I've added an amplitude envelope along with a few arguments, and again, I'll leave this as a study exercise for you if you want to get into the details on your own. And here's a short iterative function that plays four synths by picking four pitches between MIDI notes 40 and 90, rounding them to the nearest scale degree in this arbitrary collection 0, 7, 9, 10, uh, which represents C, G, A, and B flat. Amplitude is dependent on frequency, so higher pitches are a little quieter. And curve max determines how curvy the triangle wave can get, so as this value increases, the shape of the transfer function gets more and more warped, and this produces more and more higher partials in the output spectrum. Mm -hmm. 
And from here, the possibilities expand in all directions. You could, for example, jump right into P-bind and other patterns to create interesting sequences. You could modulate the amplitude of the input signal to create that evolving effect that we saw earlier. You could also go back to the drawing board and just make several different transfer functions and then choose randomly from that collection. And in some cases, you can get some really interesting results by putting several shaper eugens in series, essentially feeding the output of shaper back into itself for a second round of wave shaping. So lots to think about. Anyway, that's going to be it for tutorial 24. As I hope is clear from these two videos, wavetable synthesis provides a massive world of creative techniques for you to explore. And if that weren't awesome enough, it's one of the least expensive digital synthesis techniques in terms of CPU overhead. So I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe got some fresh ideas for your own work. In the next two videos, we're going to take a look at granular synthesis using the Eugen grain buff. In the first video, we'll focus on granulating a pre-recorded audio file stored in a buffer. And following that, I'll do a video on real-time granulation and how to apply granular synthesis to a live microphone signal. So look forward to that. And in the meantime, please leave any comments or questions below. Like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.